Is there someone in the Bible we can look at that became a mother and or something happened to a mother? And today we're going to look at the book of Ruth. We're going to look at the book of Ruth. And we're going to look at Ruth and we're going to look also at Naomi. And we're going to look at that and just pull out some things that scriptures in this book have that God inspired to be written. The ups and downs of life, we, we have plenty of those in our lives. Each one of us have ups and downs, and we have obstacles, and we have struggles. But the book of Ruth is an amazing book that deals with integrity, loving kindness, and loyalty when we look at that. And as we go through it, we're going to hit some of those and look at that, and by no means am I saying I'm up here going to, for the next, uh, you know, 45 to 55 minutes, hit everything in the book of Ruth that may pertain to what we need to take out, out for us. But um, it's a good study when you read the book of Ruth. God's presence in the book of Ruth is felt throughout the book. Whether it's the chance meeting of Boaz and Ruth. You know, did she really just happen by accident to go to work in his fields that day? Did he just happen to see her working and discover that he was related? That he was related to Naomi's family? Did the events leading to this marriage all just work out by chance? When we look at the book of Ruth, and we look closely at it and we study it, we see that God... The Lord God was taken by the character of this devoted, faithful, young widow who was willing. She was very willing. We're going to read. We're going to go through the scriptures, and we're going to read through the book here in a few minutes here. She was willing to put others' needs before her own. The unseen hand of God was at work to bring all these things to pass, especially when we... When we consider, and this is this is, I'm not trying to spoil the ending of the of the book of Ruth, and the history that it contains, but that King David and our Savior Jesus Christ descended from this special woman. And we'll look at that. This story fully supports the biblical truth written by the prophet Isaiah that God looks to those people who are poor and of contrite spirit and tremble at his word. And that's in Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Let's go to Isaiah 66 real quick just to remind us of that scripture. Isaiah 66, verse 2, he says, For all those things my hand is made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. You know? And we have been kind of talking about that the past few weeks, or the months, as we live in the world around us. God's eyes are on those who are humble, who is poor and contrite spirit. That means being humble and trembles at the word of God. And so Ruth, when we read about that, Ruth does those things. Ruth does, you know, she's, as we read through, a great example of that. In the midst of all that was happening at that time in history, the attention of our great God was caught by a quiet young widow working in the fields. You know, we see this, and one of the lessons that we can take out of this is he is most impressed with the quality of the character that we show. And that's what we need to build on. We've read many scriptures, the apostles, Peter writes about it, and Paul how our character is being built. It's something we need to focus on and we need to strive for godly character. As God told Samuel when he was searching for the one to anoint as king, 
Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that comes from 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And we remember that in our history, that Samuel thought, oh, I'm going to go see Jesse, I'm going to go see Jesse's boys. And here's all, here's all these young men coming, and they look, you know, tall. And God says, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. <laughs> Samuel finally says, is there anybody else around here? Well, my youngest is out in the field, David. And he calls and David. And he calls David over, and that's who is going to be the king of Israel the next king after Saul. Of course, again, David, the great-grandson of Ruth, was called a man after God's own heart. And when we look, and we, we're gonna, again, we're going to dive in, we're going to read. But Ruth was a widow, a foreigner in the land of Judea who had to work hard at menial labor to support herself. And she had an aged mother-in-law. Her choice to do the right thing, helping and supporting Naomi instead of just pleasing herself, brought God's blessing to her. We think about this day and age. And we live in a day and age of instant gratification. We get upset if Amazon doesn't ship the package the next day. Or within two days. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's the day and age we live in. Or the computer that we need to we need a computer to turn on it doesn't turn on within thirty seconds. What's going on with this computer? Come on, it takes a minute and a half. <laughs> or maybe our phones are a little outdated. Why is this phone not? You know, we live in a day and age of instant gratification. It's good to be reminded of the timeless lesson about the way to find real happiness and fulfillment. The Apostle Paul supported this view when he wrote that God will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And that's found in Romans 2, verse 6. Let's go to Romans 2 just to see that scripture. Romans 2, verse 6 says, Who will render to each one according to his deeds? God's watching. God sees all. Verse 7, Eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and mortality. I'm going to continue in verse 8, But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. So he renders those the good deeds. And I know Paul also writes in other scriptures, you sow what you reap. Well, you reap what you sow. Sorry, I had that backwards. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Paul also wrote in Galatians 6, let's go to Galatians 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, verse 9, Paul writes, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And again, this day and age that we live in, we see the news, and we've talked about that before, and we can see Tom. Tom does a great job of news nuggets and insights and the news he brings us and the news that we see. I mean, there's times that we feel weary. I've asked that question before in a message. Are we tired? Are we weary? But we cannot be weary doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. That's what Paul writes. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2.
1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, Paul writes, and actually he rewrites, because this actually comes out of Isaiah. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So he sees our very soul and what we're doing and how the decisions that we make. But God has prepared wonderful things for us. Wonderful things for us. You know, again, we've made mention, we talk in due season, we preach in due season. We are near the end of the Feast of Weeks as we only have a week left and a day till Pentecost. The mountain of God. The journey that we're on and it can be tiring. It can be tiring. The book of Ruth also demonstrates God's love for all people. Not just his special nation of Israel, but at that time for the Gentiles. And also pictures forward to the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where all were welcomed. All could come before the throne of God. Now you see that with Ruth. We're going to read again. We're going to read it. We're going to get there and read it. Yes, the Hebrew people, the nation of Israel, were called out. But God loves all. And all could come and join in the redemptive plan, the redemption plan, the salvation plan that He has for humanity. Ruth was a descendant of Lot. That's Abraham's nephew, and therefore technically a Gentile. It's also worthy to note and to mention that the mother of Boaz was Rahab. Rahab the prostitute. The Can he was a Canaanite. Rahab that was there at Jericho and listened to God and went and when the spies came in into Jericho, she said, you know, yeah, hide, hide in here. You know, even though that was her heritage, Ruth was selected by the Lord to be in the ge genealogical line of this world's Savior, of our Savior. And as I said, this is, you know, a preview of and a hint of the time to, to come when all nations could hear the gospel and thus ideally be united in Christ where it says in Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verse 19, the words of our Savior as He's spoken, He's speak, speaking to the apostles, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go to all of them. I believe we read last week, Paul, when he said Saul, he's to be not only to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles, but he was also going to, Paul was to go out later on. To all people that would hear the truth and be, you know, God would touch their minds. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 13 But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That was an invitation to all. And he's talking to the church in Ephesus and they were Gentiles before they made the choice to be baptized, to accept Christ. Just another wonderful thing that we can see when we read the book of Ruth. As we go, and we've already kind of mentioned this already, but when we read the book of Ruth, it demonstrates the workings of divine providence. The Lord God took favor with Ruth. His hand was in the meeting of Ruth and Boaz. And other things, too, we're going to read. You know, we will read when we get in chapter 2 how she happened to light on the portion of the field belonging to Boaz in chapter 2. Surely this was no accident. 
You know, Ruth, as a stranger in Bethlehem, knew neither persons nor properties. She might have come upon fields of strange and unfriendly owners. Who knows? God, in his wisdom, so ordered it that without knowing it, she entered the field of one who was the family of Elimelech. Emelech. I might be saying that wrong. But, but the Lord, through though seemingly na through natural causes, seemingly through natural means and natural causes, can manipulate events to accomplish his will. And what a great tribute to Ruth, who God so signally honored that he chose her over all other maidens of Israel at this critical moment in history. God's going to work with who he wills to work with. You know, it makes you think of, you know, told Moses, I'll, I'll raise up rocks to do my work. I'll find people that will do what I ask them to do. You will find It's also, we read, the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory. We, we, we live it. Think how many years. Again, you have to answer that question of yourself. How many years have you known God and been baptized and have accepted the calling? Our life's not a straight line to glory. Our straight line, it's not a line straight to that mountain of God. Hills and valleys. Maybe bumped off course here and there. And we see that in the, in the story of Ruth, Ruth's life. It's a story of setbacks. But it's also a story of hope. Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Ruth 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Amimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Shilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And again, I, I mess up the names. <laughs> you know. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took the wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Shilion also died, so the women survived her two sons and her husband. And you can't think of anything worse. Really, for Naomi. She lost, you know, her husband and her two sons. <clears throat> then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-law's daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, Return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept and they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And she's in despair. She's obviously sad, beyond sad. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. 
For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. And just, you know, just the impact of that statement. What a, I don't know, I mean, to have a Gentile say that. God must have, to me, to me, God must have blessed the family of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. And they kept, and they were a great example, kept the holy days, you know, kept the word of God. They had to be great examples. Because they weren't living in Judea, they were living in Moab. And to have Ruth say that, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. That also speaks to Ruth's character. She saw Naomi, a widow. Her sons were gone. There was going to be nobody to take care of her. And Ruth said, no, I will go with you. I will be with you. I will help you. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and the women said, Is that Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me? And the Almighty has afflicted me. So she's down. I mean, she is blaming God. And that's something we should not do. Is blame the Lord. Blame our Father in Heaven. Blame our Savior if we're in a tough spot. I mean, that's an obstacle. That's a mental obstacle. That's a spiritual obstacle. So Naomi returned and Ruth of Moab... Moab, I must say that wrong. Ruth, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Chapter 2, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. So they just, as we mentioned earlier, she just happened to find Boaz's field? And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to, see, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the family of Elimelech. Just happened to come across. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So he caught, caught the eye, you know. She caught the eye of Boaz. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Again, they're following. Boaz is following. The ser his servants are following God's word. He said, don't, don't harvest the ends of the field. Leave them. Don't, don't harvest from corner to corner, from edge to edge. Leave some along the edge for the passerby and for whoever might need it. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. He didn't have to say that. He didn't have to say that. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? 
And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? She's like, why? You know, he's being very kind. He's being very generous. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. See, there's hope building. See the hope building? There's hope. She made a commitment to the Lord God. The Lord God has heard and seen that commitment. She still has to work at it. You know, she didn't just show up and say, somebody said, hey, here's the, here's the basket of barley, have fun with it. No, she still had to work. And work, work from morning to night to get the wheat, but she was... God was blessing her to get enough for her, Naomi, and blessed her in the right field at the right time. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. And do not reproach her. And also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Again, didn't have to do that. He was following God's law just by letting her have the edges. Going, walking the edges. He did not have to do that. So we see Boaz's character. We also see the hand of God. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out, so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth, then, Ruth said, He also said to me, You shall stay close to close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. Something could have happened to her. Something bad could happen to her. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Again, hope. We see hope. There's hope. And then Naomi comes up with a plan for her daughter-in-law. Chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that may be well with you? So now, Naomi's looking out for her. Repaying. Is God moving Naomi? I believe so. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? See, she's going to tell her, because she wouldn't, Ruth wouldn't know this. She, she's from Moab. God set up a law where the family would take care of their own. In the course of a death of a husband, Ruth wouldn't know this. So Naomi's going to tell her what to do. 
Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, All that you say to me I will do. So she went to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. And in the Hebrew, although in the New King James it is translated close relative, it actually means you are the Redeemer. You are the kins, kinsman Redeemer. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end, of, at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men whether poor or rich, and now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know, know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. So he's just being honest. He says, yeah, I can do what you ask, but there's actually, according to God's word and God's law, there's somebody actually a closer relative than I am. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, or the kinsman redeemer, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you, as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. So here's another obstacle, actually. I mean, if you're thinking about it, here's another obstacle. You know, you know, you, but it's honesty, it's integrity. We have to follow God's law and His ways and be, have integrity and be truthful. And that's sometimes hard in the world that we live in. But Boaz is just showing good integrity. Uh, yeah, but according to God's law, there's someone who's a closer relative than I am and we have to go and talk to this person or I will go talk to this person. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also he said, Bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, and she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. So Boaz is on the mission to help her. One way or the other, he's going to solve this problem. But that's what Naomi said. And that His character shows through. And we have chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. So again, he's following God's law, having two or three or more witnesses for this to see what's, you know, what's going to be decided. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, 
you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. To raise up the name of the dead. To keep that line going. That was the law. They would keep the line going of the person that died. You know, the son, the brother, you know. Well, that changed. We're going to just read in a moment the next one. That changed the decision for whatever reason. That changed. That By saying that triggered this closer relative to say in verse 6. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. So for whatever reason, that changed his decision. Nope, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to redeem it. Whether that was, you know, if he would have said yes, and he, and he, this gentleman married Ruth, and had a son with Ruth, or whatever the case may be, then not only would his lands go to his son, but also the lands of Amalek, and it would all, and it, you know, he didn't want to ruin his own inheritance. Or whatever the case may be, that moment in time triggered a decision, a reversal. He said, no, I don't want to redeem it. He said, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the widow of Malon, I have required as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his possession at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Everthoth and be famous in Bethlehem. See, it's also interesting too. And they said, be like, be like Rachel and Leah. Be fruitful. She wasn't fruitful though. She, she was barren. Ruth is barren. Maybe that was maybe that maybe they found that out. Maybe that would cross the mind of the person that said, you know, I couldn't have any children with her because she's barren, and that's maybe that's why he said no. I don't know. But the women said, "Let her be like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house." Of Israel. And it says in verse 12, May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So a blessing comes. And they ask for the blessing. It says in verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative or a kinsman redeemer. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. It's kind of interesting, though, that the women said, A son born to Naomi. Obviously, grandson. The story we read, I mean, we're not done yet. We got a little bit left in, in chapter four. Not much. But the chapter, the book started with Naomi's loss. The story with Naomi. 
And it ends with Naomi's game. God had favor with her too, even though she was in the depths of sadness and despair. And she did blame the Lord God. Through Ruth and what Ruth showed her character, these wonderful blessings of hope came from heaven. It began with death. The story that we read began with death and it ends with birth. We see in Naomi's road, travels of life, a long and twisted road, a long and twisted journey. It wasn't straight on. Why didn't, what's the possibility that the, the women said a son had been born in Naomi and not to Ruth? To show that it was not true what Naomi had said in back in chapter 1, verse 21, that the Lord had not, well, she said the Lord had brought her back empty from Moab. No. No, he didn't. Ruth was with her. Ruth came back from Moab with her. She was not empty. It was different than what she took in, but she was not empty. Another example for us to look at if we would just wait and trust in God. If we have complaints and we make complaints against God, those complaints would prove untrue. I think we've all been there. We've all, I think we've all been there. In our life, different times of life, where we, you know, we question God. Maybe we blame God for something we've gone through. I don't know. Again, only each one of us can answer that. And look back. You know, Paul tells us to pray at all times. All times. Every moment. And I'm paraphrasing the scripture that he wrote, inspired to write. But we are to pray always. And come before God. There are setbacks. You know, first, you know, we look again, the gift of Ruth. Naomi's whole life seemed to cave in while in Moab, but God gave Ruth to Naomi. And again, we read it where she said, your God should be my God. And whatever that was, the example that Naomi was, or the family was, or Ruth's husband was, whatever that example was, the character of God was being shown to Ruth. And Ruth made that commitment. Also in chapter 2, we read where she was coming to take refuge under the wings of God. She left her home and family to follow. And God was there, turning Naomi's setback into joy. Even though at that moment in time, she was oblivious to it. She was blaming God. What, what awesome. It's just truly. And, they, and, and God opening the womb of Ruth. The key there, the clue to that for Ruth being barren was in chapter 4, verse 11. We just read that. The women prayed for them. The women of the town prayed for Boaz and Ruth. They knew that Ruth was married for 10 years without a child. And they remembered Rachel, whose womb the Lord had opened long before. And they pray that God will make Ruth like Rachel and Leah. So the clues are there that Ruth was barren. But through all of this, through the life of Naomi and Ruth, we see, again, the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory. But God will see us there. If we trust, we wait, we're patient, we listen, we obey. We see all of these things in the book of Ruth. From Ruth, from Boaz, you know, from the servants of Boaz, listening, obeying, following the instructions of 
God Almighty and the blessings that come from that. Then we see, let's go back and finish chapter 4. I'm going to start again in verse 17. I'm going to finish out chapter 4. So Ruth 4, verse 17. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amadab. Amadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot David. I mean, excuse me, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. It points to David. The story points, the history. The ancestor, ancestral line of David, King David. And we know that King David points forward to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, points forward to the resurrection of our mortal bodies. When death will be no more, neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I just, this book is awesome in so many different ways. I mean, we didn't need to have this book, but, you know, per se. God said we need it because it's here for us to read. I mean, we have the story of King David. We could go into Samuel and read what we talked about earlier, how Samuel, the boys, went past Samuel. And finally, go get David. Bring David in from the field. We see, we, see, we have David's story. And we have his son's story. We have Solomon's story. And we have the history of Israel from on that on. And we have the genealogy, and it leads to our Savior, Jesus Christ. But we have the book of Ruth to show us even more insight. To give us not only the life of Ruth and Naomi, but the, the life of Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. The Hebrew term is actually goel, G-O-E-L. And it signifies a kinsman with the right to redeem. He had the right to redeem. And that points to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus came to earth as a man and became our kinsman. He became human. It says that in John. Let's go to John. John 1. John 1, verse 11. He came to his own. I mean, his own being creation, human beings, but he also came to his own, the tribe of Judah, the lineage of Judah, the lineage of David, the lineage of Ruth, the lineage of Boaz. And we have redemption through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Another wonderful, the duality of all things, you know, Boaz as that Redeemer, pointing to Christ, our Redeemer, the Redeemer of mankind. Ephesians 1, verse 7. We read these scriptures, we know this. We know that one of the names, one of the titles of our Savior is Redeemer. Ephesians 1 verse 7, Paul writes about our Savior, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Physically, did not Boaz show grace and mercy to Ruth? He could have, 
He was fulfilling the law. I'm going to repeat that again. Think about that. He was fulfilling the law that God laid down about keeping the edges of the field ungleaned so that the passerbys or the widows or people that needed it could go. He said, not only that, he told his servants, Drop, have her follow you and drop some along the way. Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The book of Ruth. So many wonderful things to look at and take out. So many lessons that we can look at. And again, there's probably many I missed today. Just some things as I approach, I think, when I'm approaching the 55-minute mark today. Other things we can look at and take from. But just a character study. And again, I don't like using the word character because it seems fictional. This isn't fictional. This is our history. This is the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. A woman from Moab who God used to be part of that awesome lineage. You know, Boaz said it. You know, and it's been in, a, in there that to bless you, unlike the maidservants of Israel, it's chosen Ruth to be part of that plan. The book of Ruth is for our encouragement today. As I said at the beginning, it's a story of integrity, loving kindness, and loyalty. That we would take this into our being and check ourselves. Make sure that we have that integrity, that loving kindness, and that loyalty. And we also see God's love with Ruth. His love, his mercy, and his gr and greatness. Not only in Ruth's life, but in our lives too. How he loves us. And he has mercy with us. And, th and if we're humble in us, when we allow him to work with us, we will see the greatness of God. And by his will. When we trust in God fully, he will bless us. And he will see us to where we need to be. And he will get us to the glory that he's promised us that we shall have in the kingdom. Uh -huh.